Good afternoon, everyone. So um, you could see that I'm really green, so I'm nervous. So just at the very beginning, I forgot to introduce myself. I just, uh, my name is Hong Yan Ma, as shown here. This is my name. I know the first term in Chinese is very complicated to pronounce, but uh, fortunately, I have a very famous family name, thanks to Alibaba and Jack Ma. Right? Just, uh, I think this family name is very famous now. So there's a lot of uh, friends just call me Ma. So it's simpler. So today, uh, my topic is shown here. Uh, just a mitigating curling of concrete pavement by phase change materials, uh, incorporation, measurement, and modeling. So I, I will just address, try to address these three aspects. So okay, then in this presentation, I will give a, a introduction. And then I will talk about how to incorporate phase change materials into concrete without leading to a severe Strength, strength reduction. Then the third part will be um, will be thermal curling mitigation. Just I will talk about our device, what we used, what kind of sensors did we use to measure, to evaluate, and uh, quantify the curling of a concrete slab. Then the last will be conclusions. So first of all, let's give a, a brief introduction to curling in case there's someone without experience in pavement design. So curling is actually a kind of a curvature uh, induced by temperature change. Just thinking about that, consider a concrete pavement slab as shown here. If it's during daytime, the upper surface is heated, so the upper surface will tend to expand, while it will be convexificated. So it give you a kind of curvature as shown that, as shown that, uh, as shown here. Okay, so we call it downward curling. And during night, when this upper surface is cooled. So it's give, give a, a opposite deformation. So we call it upward curling. All right. So here, just uh, I want to note something. If you look at this pavement design about 20, 30 years ago, they used curling to describe the humidity-induced um, deformation. But uh, walking to describe the temperature change-induced uh, deformation. But nowadays, if you look at ACI documents, they just these two concepts got turned over. Right? We're, we're, we have been using curling to describe the thermal behavior. So let's just talk. Let's just say uh, thermal curling. Okay. Here, uh, as shown here, sometimes um, if you have curling, the stress can be very large. Uh, when combined with the traffic load, the concrete slab might be might be might, might break, and sometimes the, the the fatigue, the thermal fatigue, will also leads to some cracks. Well, in some cases, as I read in the literature, this magnitude of uh, Thermally induced stress can be comparable to the stress induced by traffic load. So we cannot ignore those stresses. Then phase change materials. So this is the last presentation in this session. So I suppose I do not need to introduce phase change materials anymore. I just want to say phase change materials can be used in concrete for different purposes. First of all, um, it can be used to enhance the energy efficiency of uh, our building. But when you use phase change material loaded concrete as the wall panel, as the, the roof, where you can enhance the, the overall energy efficiency. You can save some energy of uh, air conditioning. Right. Uh, you can easily find hundreds of papers from the literature regarding this issue. But in this session, we're focusing on application, on application of PCMs in concrete technology just to address the uh, temperature change induced damage problems. Also, uh, we can use it to mitigate the, the, the urban heat island effect. Um, since you can use efficient materials in pavement, in parking lots, etc. Uh, in that case, we can right, address this uh, urban heat island effect. The papers have been published, have been publicated, published. So um, then here we can also control the thermal cracking in concrete. Actually, thermal cracking as well as a freeze saw uh, damage control has been proposed about 12 years ago by Dell Benz. You can see a, a paper published on CCC on cement and concrete composite. But after that, uh, some uh, researchers has tried to address this problem. This is just one paper has selected from perhaps six or seven publications addressing the, uh, the, the thermal cracking control. And also, I, I guess Sumanta Das has a publication regarding this. I, and, um, Dr. Farnam 
had published a paper, two papers, I think, regarding the ice melting, ice and snow melting, use phase change materials. And we can also decrease the risk of phase saw damage. Uh, I, have, I have two speakers had already addressed the possibility to control the uh, phase saw damage using phase change material. But today, what I will talk about is the possibility to use phase change materials to mitigate the thermal curling of rigid pavement, that is concrete pavement. I want to tell you first, the result I will show you will be frustrating. That means our result is not very good. Just, uh, let's see what will happen. Uh, first of all, let's see some, some theories. As shown here, I think I saw similar uh, images previously. Well, I just uh, I give you two curves to compare two concrete, the, the temperature in two concrete, the control one, the control concrete, and the concrete loaded with phase change materials. You can see this is an assumed temperature fluctuation. But when you add PCM into it, you can see that the maximum temperature can be lowered somewhat. Right? So when your temperature got changed, well, you can see this two buffering platforms that's due to melting and solidifying of the phase change materials by absorb and release heat to keep constant temperature during a, a short time window. Right? So when the temperature gets changed, the rate of temperature change can also be smaller because when you add PCM into it, the thermal conductivity will be lower and um, the um, specific heat capacity will be higher. And also you can reduce, depending on which kind of, what phase changing temperature you select, where well, you can reduce the, 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 the magnitude of the temperature swing. So these three things can help you theoretically mitigate the, uh, the curling problem of a concrete pavement. Uh, the purpose of this study is to test this hypothesis. We hypothesized that it works. Actually, we do not know, so we designed something to test this hypothesis. So we will answer this question, can PCMs truly mitigate curling of concrete slab? Right, to do this, we, we divided this research into two parts. First of all, we will answer how to incorporate PCMs into concrete without strength reduction. Right, in this case, we use the lightweight aggregate. Since we, we hope uh, lightweight aggregate is stronger, um, stronger than those soft particles. So we will see the secret of uh, our technology, how we incorporate the PCM into the lightweight sand. And then the second question will be how to characterize the curling phenomenon and quantify the curling mitigation. Well, here if you look at the, li the literature, you can see some traditional methods. Well, they have been used even now. Actually, they're just used LVDTs to measure the um, the deformations on a, on a concrete pavement slab. Right? So, so we have been developing new methods uh, using fiber optic sensors, using uh, inclinometer and uh, thermal couples to uh, fully equip this concrete slab and to uh, characterize our um, thermal curling of a concrete slab. So here we come to the second part. Right? It's uh, how to incorporate phase change materials into the concrete. Right? Here's this, uh, as I just mentioned, we selected the lightweight sand. Well, it's a kind of crushed um, calcined shale, expanded shale. Right? You just expand this shale under high temperatures and crush it into smaller particles, into the sand-shaped particle, sand-sized particles. Right? So one picture is shown here. So we selected this lightweight sand because it had relatively high strengths, and it has no negative effect on cementitious materials, on cement hydration and had better interface, enhanced a uh, better interfacial transition zone, and it can provide internal curing. Right. Just so when you, sep when you um, saturate the aggregates using water and put them into concrete, it can give you internal curing. And we have been using this kind of uh, technology to uh, control the shrinkage of even UHPC without leading to strength reduction. Right. So this works very well. So here, this slide addresses these um, uh, physical properties of the PCM loaded lightweight sand. First of all, we compared the particle shape. You can see this is a normal uh, river sand. The particles are well rounded, and those are typical um, crushed, uh, expanded, expanded shale lightweight sand. 
you can see those well-rounded particles and those are irregular particles since they are from crashing. Right? And um, we just, uh, just as received aggregate particles, if you do sieve analysis, you can see this lightweight sand is much coarser than the normal river sand, and the finest modulus is much higher. So the water absorption ratio, nat uh, the natural sand is just a 1.2, that's a normal range, and uh, the lightweight sand is about 20%. Here we use the absorption capacity to load phase change materials in it. Then you can see here this is apparent uh, density. Here this uh, for normal sand is 2.6, and for our lightweight sand is only 1.6. So we also so what we did in addition to this, just uh, since we will compare the effect of those materials on the compressive strength, so we want to exclude uh, the effects of any other factors. So we actually we got a different the particles in different size range, then we re-blended them so that to achieve the same gradation as uh, lightweight sand. So actually we have been using lightweight sand and the normal river sand of the same uh, gradation, the same finest modulus, to, to compare their effect on compressive strength. So here just so we uh, took images of those graded, graded uh, sand particles with the same gradation. Uh, so uh, we wrote a small program to analyze the particle shape. As shown here, you can see that um, those lightweight sand has includes more elongated particles and they are more irregular. So later when we use this to explain the compressive strength, you can see this is uh, something beneficial. Right? It's, uh, when we have irregular particles, their interfacial, their inter interlocking, mechanical interlocking will be stronger. So this will help you to mitigate strength reduction. Then, since we have those lightweight sand, so how, how do we load the PCM into it? So you may have seen this kind of uh, uh, images before. Just a lot of people have been using vacuum suction to load phase change materials into lightweight sand. Right? You just uh, suck the aggregates, then you uh, pour, uh, you, you impregnate them with uh, melted phase change materials. Then you may need to do a filtration to remove the free, uh, the additional free phase change materials. So then you get these kind of uh, particles. You can see they're covered, coated with phase change materials. You can imagine that if you use these particles to make concrete, the strength will be lower because of those uh, harmful, these deleterious, de deleterious materials. And so you have to try something to remove this coat of uh, PCM. Right? Those are three normal methods. The first method is in the literature is a kind of assumption, right? You assume that if you add um, phase change materials less than the absorption capacity, all of those phase change materials can be absorbed into the particles. So none of them will be in the outer surface. So that is just an assumption. The assumption is an assumption, not real. Then the second one, so you can use, uh, you can use some, some wipe, right? You can wipe the uh, phase change materials. But if you have a well-rounded big particle, it's easy to do. But you have a lot of small particles, it's not practical. Right? Large amount of small particles is not practical at all. And the third one, oven drying, so you can put these particles in oven and heat it to a temperature a little bit higher than the melting temperature of the fish in the materials. Then you can assume that you can uh, evaporate uh, some of the fish in the materials. But again, when the amount is large, when the, cement, when the sand particles are small, this is not practical or efficiency is low. So we have not been using this, this methods. We have not been using um, vacuum uh, suction and those methods. So our methods is kind of uh, warm water rinsing. So we just uh, prepare, we just actually dry the aggregate particles. Then we put them on the solid phase change materials and heat them to a higher temperature. When they are melted, so the dried particles will absorb the fish materials. Then we filtrate it. Then we use um, warm water with a temperature a little bit higher than the phase changing temperature to remove the surface, the, the phase changing material that adhered to the surface of the aggregate particles. Then you can see, as shown here, if we're not rinsing them, the, uh, the, the tested absorption ratio of phase changing materials will be 24%. That had included those materials adhered on the, on the external surface. Um, if we 
rains them, then we got a 16%. But as I mentioned before, previously, if you have small particles, even you rinse them, the efficiency is low. You cannot remove all of those entire phase changing materials. So we, we did something more. Right, you can see from the gradation curves, if we cut the sand from here, right, so 1.19, that is standard sieve opening size. Right? If we cut it from here, we have 20% sand particles smaller than it, and the majority of sand particles are larger. So we selected that threshold sieve opening size, and we only get uh, larger particles. I mean particles larger than 1.19 millimeter. We only use this procedure to treat the large particles, then remix them with the smaller particles and get um, the PCM functionalized uh, fine particle, um, uh, sand particles. So in that way, although we are not um, getting maxim maximized amount of phase change materials, but actually we can well control the leakage problem. So here I show a particle, one of the treated particle. Inevitably, you will have some empty pores that will not be filled by any phase changing materials. And the majority of the pores will be filtered, will be filled by phase changing materials. And the surface pores will be saturated by water. So this is one single particle, phase changing material loaded single particle. So we're just using these particles to prepare of motors. Shown here, we have a control motor, it's just using normal river sand. And the lightweight sand motor is uh, saturated with water. But we have this graded, rinsed, lightweight sand particles with phase change materials. This is, we only loaded the large particles with PCM. And the last one is the phase change material loaded sand, part, sand, the sand motor, but we didn't rinse them. So we got four groups of uh, motor. Then we tested the compressive swings. As you can see here, this, this black one showed the control motor. Right? So when we use lightweight sand saturated with water, while well, in the early age, some of it can be higher, can be lower, but if you look at these 28 day strengths, while well, the strengths are comparable to the control motor. Uh, if we use the graded, rinsed, PCM loaded aggregates, well, you can see the 28 strengths is still comparable to the control motor. But if you do not rinse them, meaning that you have fission materials on the outer surface, the strength will be cut by over 50%. So that is severe. You will never want to see that. Well, here this is some uh, microscopic explanation of this uh, negative effects. If you do not rinse the fission materials, you can see that uh, this fission free PCMs will be existing separately or in hair on the surface of the aggregate, or sometimes they can even bond the small particles together to give you a, a larger particle. So when you, when you mix those particles into your motor, those will be defects. As shown here under a microscope, those will be big defects. Okay, if you rinse them, use a warm, warm motor to rinse them, you will see no obvious defects will be there. So the strengths can be comparable to our control model. Okay, here is, again, this is shown another um, SEM images. Showing that if you use normal river, river, river sand, you will have interfacial transition zone. Uh, if you have been using lightweight aggregates, uh, lightweight sand, but the interfacial transition zone is not obvious. Actually, look at the interface, you can see uh, we do uh, calcium and silicate mapping. You can see the interpenetration between the aggregate and the cement hydration products. Actually, the interface is very strong, enhanced interface. So if we explain the comparable strengths, although the sand particles, the lightweight sand particles are weaker than normal sand, but actually due to the enhanced interface and the irregular particle shape, the strengths can, will, will not be reduced. And some additional effects as shown here, Hope you still remember in the in the surface pores we have some water, right? So we hope that this water can give you some internal curing to some extent. So we tested the shrinkage. So this is the control motor. You have a very big shrinkage. Uh, if we use our PCM functionalized uh, lightweight sand, while well, the shrinkage, autogenous shrinkage, will be mitigated, obviously. But if you test the lightweight sand fully saturated with water the curve will be there. Right. 
little expansion, no shrinkage at all. Um, then another effect is uh, here, as we tested some semi-adiabatic uh, temperature rise. You can see here, this is a control motor, and that is a um, uh, water-saturated lightweight sand, so no big change. A little lower temperature will be due to the water in the, in, in the sand particles. But if you use phase change materials, you can see that the maximum temperature will be lowered, obviously, and you can see during heating and cooling process, we will have the buffering platforms. And this platform is, is very important uh, since if you, mo if you uh, try to calculate to, to, to model the thermal cracking, you will know the cooling process is more critical. Right? This we shows a lower cooling rate during this process. So we can assume that we can hypothesize that these phase change materials can effectively mitigate thermal cracking. I only show this hypothesis here. Well, here's the third part. This is the measurement. How do we evaluate the effect of uh, the PCMs on the purling? Okay, here I will show you some some technologies in, in my lab. So the first one is uh, some fiber optic sensors. I, I call the uh, OFDR fiber optic sensors. They are used to monitor the temperature as well as strain. Right, these are uh, truly distributed high resolution sensors. Then uh, the second sensor is shown here. This is a self developed sensor. I call it a high resolution inclinometer. You can see it can be fixed on the top surface of the slab. So when you have tilting, the tilting angle will be monitored. Well, the mechanism is shown, the working mechanism is shown here. If anyone is interested, I will spend some time to explain the working mechanism later. Right. But anyway, so here we have, um, when, when you have um, the tilting, while well, our uh, optical fiber will be detecting some distance change between this mass block and uh, the fiber optic sensors and the face. Then you, we can use this uh, distance change to, ca to, ca to calculate the tilting angle. So here I'll show you the fully equipped concrete slab, motor, motor slab. And see here, this is a slab, and we will heat it using a lamp shown here. So we uh, added three layers of fiber optic sensors to monitor the temperature and the, and the strain. But they are embedded sensors. They cannot monitor the, the surface temperatures. So we use the thermocouples attached to the top surface and the bottom surface to monitor the temperatures on these two surfaces. Right? Then we add one inclinometer on the top surface. Then we just, so when we started the, the, the monitoring, the test, you cannot see this thing because they will be wrapped up using a reflective um, foil. So as shown here. So the heating process as shown here, this is we will have a one hour equi um, equivalent time and then heat it in six hours and cooling in five hours. This is the frustrating result I mentioned earlier. <laughs> it's, uh, as I expected at the very beginning, due to the melting of the phase change materials, the top surface temperature of the PCM incorporated slab is lower than the control slab. But you can see the melting process by this uh, buffering platform. But after that, the temperature in the phase change material incorporated slab increased much faster than the control slab. This is due to, apart from the top layer, beneath the top layer you have the phase change materials too. They will stop the heat transfer downward. Right? So you will have a lot of heat accumulated on the top surface, increasing the, the top surface temperature. So you can see the top surface temperature will be much higher than the control one. But if you look at the bottom temperature, the PCM loaded motor will be always lower than the control motor. Right, this is very good in you know, in a wall panel. When we talk about energy efficiency, right, you always expect that the internal temperature is lower than the outer temperature than the control one. You will you will control the, the, the internal temperature. So this is good enough for a energy uh, for energy saving. Uh, uh, how about concrete pavement slab? Uh, this will, will make some problem, right? since you're just uh, creating a larger temperature difference between the top surface and the bottom temperature. Right? 
you get a larger temperature difference, the curling will be more severe. Uh, this, uh, the first figure shown here is just the temperature difference. Uh, this is the phase change material loaded one, and that is the control one. You can see the MERS is only in the first hour. So after that, the temp temperature difference always larger right, in the heating process. So the second figure shows the measurement, the data from the measurement using the inclinometer. Right, this is show you really the tilting angle is much larger in the phase change material loaded slab. Uh, what's shown here is this, um, this uh, fiber optic sensor monitored the temperature and the strain. Here's the temperature distribution and evolution and uh, strain, a thermal strain. And then this is the control motor and the second column is the PCM loaded motor. Because it is consistent with the other monitor. This is based on this data, we can calculate the thermal, the coefficient of thermal expansion. As shown here, we just plotted the data. And this is the, the coefficient determined by the strain over temperature change. We, are, we already get those data. So just uh, do a simple calculation. We can get the um, coefficient of thermal expansion of uh, both motors. And we used them. Add the input in a, to, to feed a feature, to, to feed the FEM modeling. Apart from this parameter, we also need to use uh, thermal conductivity and um, the, uh, the, the uh, heat capacity. So these parameters for the normal uh, sand motor slab are constant, but for the feed chain materials, they are not constant. So we try to get different numbers from measurement and modeling. Uh, anyway, based on those inputs, we modeled the uh, curling problem. So you can see that according to the modeling, the, the temperature change, the temperature of the top surface are consistent with our measurement. So this is a validated our, our measurement. So that is to say, your curling will be more severe during the heating process. So shall we not use PCM to control curling? This is so far based on the analysis, the conclusion is yes, we, we should not use, we should not use PCM materials. But uh, wait a minute, you know, we may have another method. Since I mentioned if you use phase change materials, the bottom temperature will always be lower. So how about we will not load the PCM into the whole material? We just add an overlay, a thin overlay on it, on top of it. So this is a new thinking and this is just a modeling. I have not monitored anything. Just based on this FEM analysis, if you add uh, phase change materials overlay, a thin overlay on top of concrete slab, you observe the top surface again on the concrete, on the concrete slab only, the top surface temperature will always be lower. If you look at the temperature change, temperature, temperature difference between these two surfaces, difference will always be smaller, lower. Meaning that if you just add this thin overlay, it will be an effective method to control the curling problem. Again, this assumption I have not measured uh, using my, my equipment. Okay. And another way, this can be much cheaper since you just need a, a thin overlay. Right? So it will save a lot of phase change materials. Well, conclusions. Um, so first of all, we use this method. We didn't reduce the compressive strength. And the different sensors can be integrated to monitor the curling to evaluate uh, the potential uh, mitigation problems, uh, the potential curling problems. And then if you directly add PCMs into the pavement, possibly you will enlarge the curling problem. Right? But if you design it into a thin overlay, very likely you can control effectively the curling problem. And here in the end, I will show you something just uh, in my research group, this is what I have been doing. Just my uh, research philosophy, I have been doing all of the uh, things here. My major uh, expertise are here, is uh, developing and characterize uh, different cement-based materials. Actually, I'm not very comfort and uh, confident in talking about phase change materials and pavement design. So just say, uh, if I talk about cement hydration, I would be more confident. So this is my, my major expertise, shown here, this uh, characterization and modeling of cement-based materials. But I also do something like uh, uh, deterioration, retardation, and mitigation, well, repair and then rehabilitation materials, and also some sensing technology. 
as well as demolition waste management. And so those research has been enabled by my research group as shown here. I have currently a pretty big team and it's, uh, funded by these resources. Thank you, so that's all for my presentation.